Welcome to Pediatric Podcast for PedsCases.com. Hello, welcome back to part two of our series on puberty and puberto disorders. My name is Rojin Boo and I'm a medical student at the University of Alberta. This series was created with the help of Dr. Elizabeth Rosolowski, a pediatric endocrinologist at the University of Alberta. Previously in part one, we examined the underlying physiology and clinical presentations of normal puberty. Now in this second episode, we will specifically discuss an approach to precocious puberty. By the end of this session, the learner should be able to describe the clinical criteria for diagnosing precocious puberty, list the common causes of precocious puberty, outline an approach for the common causes of precocious puberty. In part one of our series, we were introduced to a five-year, six-month-old girl seen for concerns regarding the growth of pubic hair that started six months ago. We observed that this girl is showing isolated growth of pubic hair with no breast development, so we deemed that she's not going through true puberty. But what could be the potential causes for isolated pubarchy? Is five years of age too young to have tenor stage 2 pubic hair? So, what is early or precocious puberty? Precocious puberty can be subdivided by the gonadotropin status, either gonadotropin dependent or gonadotropin independent. Gonadotropin dependent puberty is also known as central precocious puberty. This refers to true puberty. The HPG axis is reactivated. The levels of gonadotropins and particularly LH increase, stimulating the ovaries or testes to ramp up its production of sex steroids and setting off the entire chain of pubertal events in a normal sequence. Because this is the sequence of events that happens in normal puberty, gonadotropin-dependent precocious puberty always occurs in an isosexual fashion, meaning that the physical manifestations are in line with the child's sex. So in girls, we should only see signs of female puberty, like the start of breast development or menses. In boys, we should only see signs of male puberty, like an increase in testicular size. The sex steroids come from the gonads. So you can think of gonadotropin-dependent precocious puberty as being like quote-unquote normal puberty, only happening atypically early. The other type that we have is the gonadotropin-independent precocious puberty, also known as peripheral or pseudo-precocious puberty. It's not true puberty because it is independent of the input from hypothalamus and pituitary, and the sex steroids may not be coming from the gonads. Gonadotropin levels are prepubertal or suppressed because of the negative feedback from sex steroids on the hypothalamus and pituitary gland. The sex steroids are made autonomously without any stimulating gonadotropins. These steroids can come from the gonads, the adrenal glands, or other ectopic places in the body like the liver. There can also be an exogenous source, for example, medications. Because there's no regulation of sex steroid production by the gonadotropins, the physical manifestations of puberty can occur out of normal sequence. This means that a boy may achieve 10 or 4 pubic hair development without testicular enlargement, or a girl can have menstrual bleeding before breasts fully develop. The physical manifestations in peripheral precocious puberty can be isosexual or contrasexual. For instance, Girls can have a male pattern hair distribution like chest hair, and boys can develop gynecomastia, which specifically refers to breast development in boys. <laughs> Clinically, gonadotropin-dependent precocious puberty is considered when the onset of breast development, or theolarchy, occurs in girls younger than 8 years of age. In girls of African descent, their pubertal milestones are achieved earlier on average, so the cutoff is one year earlier younger than 7 years of age. In boys, gonadotropin-dependent precocious puberty refers to testicular enlargement, growth of testes to 4 milliliter or greater in volume, or 2.5 centimeter or greater in length, before 9 years of age. At times, girls and boys may present with pubic hair and or axillary hair without breast development or testicular enlargement, respectively. If only hair appears before the age of 8 years for girls or before 9 years for boys, it is considered gonadotropin-independent or peripheral precocious puberty. 
Here, the main distinction is that having only hair would not be central puberty. Central puberty is suggested by breast development in girls and testicular enlargement in boys. Now, when we look at the different causes of precocious puberty, we can describe them as gonadotropin dependent, gonadotropin independent, or as a normal variant. Let's begin with gonadotropin dependent or central precocious puberty. Because it is gonadotropin driven, we need to think about what is happening in the head. Are there any findings in the central nervous system or CNS that could affect the hypothalamus and pituitary? If we do find issues in the CNS, hypothalamic hematoma is the most common cause. Hypothalamic hematoma is a congenital, non-malignant mass in the brain, and we think that it contains an intrinsic GnRH pulse generating capacity. If there's a premature release of GnRH pulses, it could lead to the onset of precocious puberty. Other CNS lesions that you should consider include tumors, cerebral malformations, and physical injuries to the CNS. In the majority of clinical cases, however, we do not find any CNS lesions. Most often, we do not observe any findings at all, and we refer to this as idiopathic. Gonadotropin-dependent precocious puberty can also be related to genetics and international adoption, possibly due to an improved nutrition and weight gain after adoption. For both boys and girls, the most common cause of central precocious puberty is idiopathic. However, and this is important to remember, boys are more likely to have a cause for their central precocious puberty, and if a cause is found, it is most likely to be a hypothalamic hematoma. Now, moving on to gonadotropin independent or peripheral precocious puberty. Here, the hypothalamus and pituitary are not activated to drive the secretion of GnRH and the gonadotropins. The sex steroids may arise from autonomous secretion from the gonads, but the sex steroids may also come from elsewhere. Therefore, the secondary sexual characteristics exhibited may not be compatible with the child's sex. Certain genetic disorders can lead to gonadotropin-independent precocious puberty. For example, in McCune Albright syndrome, the gonads themselves can be activated autonomously to produce estrogen or testosterone. Intestinal toxicosis, also known as familial male-limited precocious puberty, there is a mutation in the LH receptor leading to an increased production of sex steroids. There could also be tumors in the gonads, liver, or mediastinum that are rapidly producing sex steroids. Peripheral precocious puberty can also be due to too much adrenal androgens being produced, notably congenital adrenal hyperplasia, or CAH. In the most common form of CAH, we see a mutation of an enzyme involved in the synthesis of aldosterone, cortisol, and sex steroids in the adrenal glands. When there is a mild degree of enzyme deficiency, the body makes enough cortisol and aldosterone to not become acutely ill, but there is an excessive amount of androgen. Mild forms of CAH are also known as non-classical CAH. Patients may present with pubic hair, axillary hair, and acne. Boys may also have increased growth of the penis. However, girls would not demonstrate breast development and boys would not demonstrate testicular enlargement. Another cause of peripheral precocious puberty to consider is an exogenous source of sex steroids, although this occurs much more rarely. For example, a boy or girl may have had exposure to a family member's testosterone gel. The normal variants of precocious puberty are non-pathological and do not require any treatment other than observation and monitoring. The two most common normal variants of precocious puberty that a pediatrician or family doctor are likely to encounter are premature thelarchy and premature adrenarchy. Benign premature thelarchy refers to an early onset of breast development, usually noted at 6 to 12 months of age. It is considered normal variant because the hypothalamus and pituitary are still inactive. The levels of GnRH and gonadotropins are undetectable in the blood. There is no pubic hair or any other secondary sexual characteristics present, and there is no acceleration in height, just as we would expect in other infants of the same age. Breasts remain small with little to no progression. The breast tissue should spontaneously disappear by three years of age. Benign premature adrenarchy refers to the growth of pubic hair, usually before eight years of age. In this condition, we only see the growth of pubic hair. 
There is no breast development for girls and no testicular enlargement for boys. There is also no high acceleration. The child may be in tenor stage 2 based on the pubic hair. It is important to stress here that these two entities are considered to be diagnoses of exclusion. The child must be followed over time to ensure there's no progression of puberty. Now that we have reviewed the different causes of precocious puberty, we will go over the approach to precocious puberty. The first step in evaluating a child suspected of precocious puberty is taking a focus history. We need to know what do they mean by puberty? Do they mean just a hair growth, or breast development, or genital development? When were the findings first noted? How fast are they progressing? In addition, we need to check for the child's height and growth velocity. If there's a rapid growth rate, there's concerns for a significant production of sex steroids which cause growth acceleration. In regards to family history, we need to ask the age of onset of puberty in parents and siblings, if applicable. We also need to delve into whether there are any signs or symptoms related to the brain suggesting increased intracranial pressure, such as headaches and or visual impairment. Next, on the physical exam, we need to tenor stage breasts in girls, genitals in boys, and pubic hair in both. We also need to look for any clinical signs of puberty and any signs of contrasexual development. Does the girl have hirsutism, a male pattern hair distribution? Does the boy have gynecomastia? If the child shows any contrasexual development, we should be considering causes of peripheral precocious puberty. To examine for CNS-related abnormalities, we can perform visual field testing and fundoscopic exam to look for signs of increased intracranial pressure. If there is increasing evidence of precocious puberty from a focused history and physical exam, we should consider appropriate lab investigations. We can order a bone age to evaluate the effect of sex steroids on bone maturation. Children with precocious puberty generally have a more advanced bone age than their chronological age. We also measure the levels of sex steroids, and most importantly, the levels of gonadotropins. The measurements of gonadotropins should be done in the morning because they are initially produced in the body when a child is asleep, and their levels wane throughout the day. If we see an elevated level of LH and FSH that is normally seen during puberty, this strongly suggests a gonadotropin dependent or central cause. We would then proceed to image the brain via MRI to look for any CNS lesions if there is reasonable suspicion. In general, it is recommended to obtain a pituitary MRI for all boys presenting with central precautious puberty because of the higher chance of significant lesions, and for girls less than 6 years of age or with rapidly progressing central precocious puberty. Conversely, if we see that the levels of LH and FSH are undetectable, this directs us towards a gonadotropin independent or peripheral cause. Then, we need to consider screening for non-classical CAH and look for tumors with ovarian, testicular, or adrenal ultrasound. Let's now return to our case example. From history and physical exam, we know that this 5-year, 6-month-old girl has isolated pubic hair growth. Her height and growth velocity appear normal. There is a family history of early growth of pubic hair as well. As you may recall, these features are more aligned with the clinical recognition of gonadotropin independent precocious puberty. On physical exam, we do not appreciate any signs of control sexual development or CNS abnormalities. Upon further investigation, we see that her bone age is not advanced. The level of androgens is mildly elevated, but the levels of gonadotropins remain suppressed. Based on these results, we have increased our confidence in a gonadotropin independent cause and we proceed to screen for non-classical CAH. We do not suspect a tumor because her androgen levels are not significantly elevated. Now let's conclude this video with a review of our learning objectives. Describe the clinical criteria for precocious puberty. List the common causes of precocious puberty. Outline an approach for the common causes of precocious puberty. Thanks for your attention and be sure to check out part 3 of our series on an approach to delay puberty. Check out www.peedscases.com for more great podcasts, videos, interactive cases, questions, and more. Press subscribe on iTunes to get access to all of our podcasts. 
If you like what we do, please leave a review on the iTunes Store. Share with your friends and colleagues, or think about getting involved.